A common misconception among the tech community is that a system which cools itself using a liquid must be more efficient and therefore more powerful. Now obviously this isn't true. You could liquid cool a graphing calculator and not much would happen. But why then do so many computer enthusiasts opt for a water cooling solution? And better yet, why do CPUs and GPUs they take advantage of get so hot? Think of it this way, almost all desktop grade CPUs run hot under load. It's just a fact of life that we all have to deal with. Intel does offer laptop grade chips and chipsets like the Atom Batrel lineup, but these are significantly underpowered and underutilized, and even they get fairly warm. So why? Well, it all has to do, believe it or not, with thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics states that heat is a form of energy, and that all forms of energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but rather transformed into other forms of energy, i.e. electrical energy to mechanical energy and vice versa. The second law of thermodynamics states that entropy, that is the randomness of any cycle, is always greater than or equal to a factor of zero. This means that the disarray or inefficiency of a cycle cannot be reversed, only restricted to zero or expressed as some value greater than zero. So what do these two have to do with your computer? Well, first off, keep in mind that your computer, when powered on, is always going to be hotter than it was when turned off and at room temperature. Essentially, the second law decrees that your computer will never be 100% efficient, and that energy losses in the form of heat are inevitable. So when you push that power button and fire things up, some amount of electrical energy supplied by your PSU will not make it to your CPU or graphics card. On top of that, a lot of energy that does make it to your CPU and GPU will be dissipated as heat as your chip processes data. If you were to hold a thermal scope up to your computer tower or laptop, you'd likely notice a vast majority of heat coming from one of two places, either your central processing unit or your graphics processing unit. But why in particular do these two get the hottest? Well, processing units have a bunch of transistors packed inside of them. Imagine them as switches, switching from an on state to an off state over and over again. And in between each switching process, there's a point at which each transistor acts like a resistor. So when a single transistor inside of a CPU is in the on or off state, current flows with relatively low resistance and not much heat is generally dissipated. But as a transistor switches between the two states, a current semi flows through it, acting more like a resistor than anything else. This is because the current travels partially through metal and partially through air. Resistors are designed to do one thing, reduce the amount of current supplied. Ohm's law, denoted by the equation V equals IR, can be re-expressed as I equals V over R, where power, or current, denoted by I, is directly proportional to the voltage V supplied and indirectly proportional to the resistance R applied. As resistance in any current increases, the total current flow must decrease. Now, recall the first law of thermodynamics. Since energy can neither be created nor destroyed, the part of the electrical energy that was eliminated from the circuit by the series or parallel of resistors present must be converted into another form of energy. Since there is no mechanical or chemical work to be done, the electrical energy that was resisted by the resistors must convert into heat. So in your CPU, each switching stage inside of every resistor produces heat, and there are over 1 billion transistors inside of each Intel Haswell processor. As you may have also deduced by now, the number of times a transistor switches between its on and off states is also directly linked to how much heat is given off. If transistor A and transistor B are entirely the same, and transistor A switches more times per second than transistor B, as long as the same current is applied to both, then transistor A will consequently release more heat. Kinda cool, huh? Well, maybe not in practice, but in theory it's pretty neat. Now, when overclocking a CPU or GPU, you're essentially increasing the number of electrical pulses that each transistor receives. This increases the number of switches between the on and off states, and therefore increases the total heat output. This is why so many overclocking computer enthusiasts insist on installing water cooling units. Water has a very high heat capacity, and therefore is capable of transporting large amounts of heat without changing its own temperature very much at all. So there you have it, CPUs and GPUs get hot because of partial resistance, and therefore oftentimes require unorthodox measures to keep them within their operating temperature limits. And I say unorthodox because, well, electricity and water generally don't work well together. It's kind of cool nowadays to see computers and their builders utilizing such opposing forces for greater good. This is Science Studio. Thanks for learning with us.